yesterday, last Sunday, we saw what is called as a sin offering. Sin offering is different from guilt offering. You may say, Pastor, all those offerings are over, right? How does it matter to us? I want to share with you something very powerful from the Word of God about the guilt and how to overcome that guilt. What are the symptoms of guilt? How do you know this person is guilty? How, how do you know this person has guilt in his heart? Or how do you know she has that guilt in his heart? So we're going to study from the Bible and see how we overcome such situations. We are all vulnerable to all these problems. We are all human beings. The greatest of the men also falls prey to such things. So today we're going to study this guilt offering. I'm in Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1. Verse 1. I mean, uh, in order to save time, let me give you a run through uh, in a very simple way and uh, give you an idea about what this guilt offering is about. Guilt offering is also called a trespass offering. It's called a guilt offering and also called a trespass offering. So what do you find in this? You find that you have to bring a ram. You have to bring a a female goat, female goat or a female lamb as a sin offering and then you present it to the priest. Now verse 7 says, Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 7, if he cannot afford a lamb, he is to bring two doves or two young pigeons to the Lord as a penalty for his sin, one for a sin offering and one for the burnt offering. Verse 11, if he however cannot afford two doves or two young pigeons, he is to bring an ephah, uh, an offering for his sin as a tenth of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering. He must not put oil or incense on it because it is a sin offering. So then you find, what you find here is uh, the sin offering and the burnt offering. For example, when you bring two doves or two pigeons, one is for sin offering, the other one is for burnt offering. So how do you distinguish this? How do you distinguish this guilt offering as far as the two doves and two pigeons is concerned, it is sin offering plus a burnt offering is equal to guilt offering. As simple, right? Guilt offering is, trespass offering is a sin offering plus a burnt offering. One bird for one, one bird for another. One bird for sin offering, one bird for burnt offering. Sin offering plus burnt offering is equal to guilt offering. Okay, now, um, I, um, not only that, what you need to do is, when you have when you have that guilt what do you need to do verse 16 he must make a restitution for what he has failed to do in regard to the holy things add a fifth of the value to that and give it to the priest who will make atonement for him with the ram as a guilt offering and he will be forgiven so what do we understand when you take the bible so talks about suppose you take hundred dollars from somebody and you don't return it and you forget about it and someday you remember, hey, I took $100 from him, I need to return. When you return the money, you don't give him $100, you have to give him $120. Add one-fifth of the value of what you have taken. This is there in the book of Leviticus all through. When you take something from somebody, you need to add a fifth of the value to the original amount and then give it to that person. This is what uh, God was telling them. Now, there are several aspects of guilt offering that we need to remember. The first thing that is, the person may recognize it, that he has done it, or may not recognize it. Do you get the difference? You may recognize or you may not recognize it. What does it mean? Look at verse 1. Let's, let's look at verse 1. If a person sins because he does not speak up, when he hears a public charge, to testify regarding something he has seen or learned about, he will be held responsible. What does it mean? Now, there was an incident between uh, two people, okay? But there was an incident between two people. And you saw that. You saw that. And there came a situation that we had to hash it out and then clarify and solve this problem. When you had to clarify this problem and you saw that, so suppose I call you and say, brother, uh, I came to know that you were there when that situation happened. Now I want you to speak up and say, 
what exactly happened and he says no 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 uh, they are my friends you know how can I uh, speak against them you know both are my friends I mean that's usually what what you what happens uh, so I can say nothing about them no 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 take it easy you know so you go away after 10 years you remember and say I should have said that I should have told that day I was there at that place and now after 10 years later your heart starts pricking you for that you know what you do that's when you bring the guilt offering sin is different guilt is different you agree with me sin is an act guilt is what comes after the sin guilt also comes because of memory sin is an act but the guilt is much more dangerous why because guilt will eat you away from inside I want to give you good news about this when God forgives us how does he forgive um, in the Bible study during the midweek I must have shared this with you but I want to remind this once again I want you to I, I know if you have not written this, this down you can write this down I'll give you three verses three verses let's look at these three Micah chapter 7 and verse 19 Micah chapter 7 and verse 19 what do you see here how God forgives a sinner how does God forgive a sinner verse 19 you again will have compassion on us you will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea you have hurled all our iniquities into the depths of the sea there's one uh, Micah 7 19 uh, how many of you still uh, remember that Malaysian airplane is still missing right is still missing such a huge airplane more than 230 lives in that and that's missing okay and people are trying to still find it uh, I hope they at least find it so that it is some relief to the pair to the families my dear brothers and sisters the the sins that you and I committed the way God forgives is he has hurled them into the depths of the sea that you can never find them again never find them again second verse Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 17 you must have these three together what I do in my Bible is in all these three verses wherever I'm quoting um, if it is Micah 7 19 I will write the other two verses when I come to Isaiah 38 17 I will write the remaining two okay so that's how I remember uh, all these verses together at a place because of the same context Isaiah chapter 38 and verse 17 surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish in your love you kept me from the pit of destruction you have put all my sins behind your back you have put all my sins behind your back God so that's a kind of a picture that God is trying to put uh, has put your sins and my sins behind his back because what we cannot see our back we cannot see our back right so you can try to turn it out turn turn as many times and try to do any composure any posture you will never be able to see your back what does it mean God says I don't even I, I don't want to even see those sins that I have forgiven you Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 34 Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 34 no longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying know the Lord because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more I will forgive their sins and remember them no more so God says I won't remember I don't remember so if God says I don't remember your sins can anybody come and try to remind him 
Yeah, there is one fellow who comes and reminds God all the time. He comes and reminds all the time. Look at Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven. Now have, the com now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. So who is this man? Who is this person? He is Satan. So what is he doing? He is going into the presence of God and then he is accusing you and me in front of God. He is accusing me in front of God. What does he say? He goes to God. You know, remember in book of Job, he, had, he could go to God and talk to him. God would say, did you see my son Job and all these things. So you know that story. So what Satan does, what happens in the heavenly realm? I want to tell you brothers and sisters, I want you to be very careful about what you're listening now. Whatever we do, there is an impact about our activities on the earth and it has an impact in heaven for everything that we do. Newton's law, what does it say? There is an equal and opposite reaction, right? So what is happening in our lives is what we do here on this earth has an impact in heaven. For example, you serve God. By The Bible says, if you give a cup of cold water to somebody in my name, what's happening in the heaven? You have a reward, right? Suppose you, uh, you are mad at your husband. You're mad at your husband. You're mad at your wife. What happens? Yeah, the Bible says God won't hear your prayers. So your prayers go up. What is happening? They're all falling into the trash bin. All your prayers are falling into trash bin. Why? Because you don't have peace with your husband. The Bible says the, you need to have that peace. The men must look at women as a weaker vessel and therefore you must be together. And therefore, unless you do that, your prayers will never be answered. So what we do on this earth has an impact in heaven. Are you getting it? What we do here has an impact in heaven. Book of Job, what does it say? He lived a good life, there was an impact in heaven. What, whether we do good or bad, there is a repercussion, there is an impact in heaven because of what we do here on this earth. So what do we see here? What do we see? When this, when this guilt comes into, how does this guilt come back? How does this guilt come? There are several ways it comes. Number one, Satan reminds you of that guilt. Satan will remind you of your sin. Say, do you remember what you did last time? I told you that you are, you see, you say you are a victorious Christian. But don't you think you are falling every time on the same sin? You are falling every time. How many times ever you are told, you are not listening. Apart from God's voice, please remember this, Satan also can speak to a man. You know, one of the best Bible teachers could be Satan. You know why? He knows the whole scripture. He knows everything. We need to know whose voice we are hearing. When we started this church on the first day, how many of you remember, I showed you a video of a shepherd and a lot of other people and there was a lot of sheep in the background and some people started shouting and said, hey, come, 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 all the sheep, right? Start making noises. Three people tried. Did the sheep even lift up their heads and look? No. They did not even lift up their heads and look. They didn't care. Ignored. But when the real master came, when the real master came, and the first call, all the sheep stopped eating their grass, looked up and saw, and the master was calling them. You see, they left eating all the grass. They came in droves and followed this shepherd. My dear brother and sister, I want to tell you, Satan wants to play havoc with our lives. So therefore, how does he come? He comes like an angel of light. He will come with the scripture. If somebody comes with the, some other philosophy 
or with some other uh, stuff or some other religious book, you would not even care because you will put on your guard and say, okay, this is a cult. I don't agree with this. This is not the right way. I'm not going to agree with this. But if somebody comes with the same scripture, what would you do? You open the door and say, yeah, please come in, please come in. When Jesus was tempted, what did Satan use? When, when Satan tempted Jesus on that mountain, what did Satan use? Did he use a, a philosophy? What did he use? He used the word of God. The word of God. Therefore, we need to be very careful when we hear the voice. Is it the voice of God or is it the voice of the enemy? Very simple. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. How do you know you are my sheep? You'll hear my voice. That's what God says. If you're not, from, no, not my sheep, you won't listen to me. Therefore, what does Satan do? He goes to God and then reminds you about your failures. He whispers in your ear. See what happened? See what did you do? What happens because of that? I want to tell you some symptoms of guilt. You may say, yeah, it's a good, good, uh, good thing I'm learning today, but how do I know I'm guilty? Every, a lot of people have different ways of guilt, okay? Let me, let me, let me, I, I, I tried to write down a few. So let me see uh, what they are. Number one, number one, the symptoms of guilt. How do you know somebody has guilt? Number one, they will try to cover up whatever they have done. When you have guilt, you will try to cover up whatever you have done. How do you know? Adam and Eve. What happened that day when they disobeyed God and committed sin? When God came, as usual, what was the reaction? What was the reaction? They had covered themselves and they were hiding. Not only physically they were running away, they didn't want to have any contact with him. They know he's coming, they try to avoid. I tell you, Garden of Eden is such a wonderful, wonderful place, a lot of lessons we can learn. I tell you, as much as the word is uh, appealing to you, it appeals to me too. It's a two-edged sword. What happens at the time of guilt is, we try to cover up. God came and said, did you eat the fruit? What did he say? He put it on his wife. When God went and asked Eve and said, Eve, did you eat that fruit? She put it on the serpent. You will try to cover up. You will not be honest when you have that guilt. Look at Cain. When Cain killed Abel, God came and asked him, where's your brother? What did he say? What did he do? He said, am I my brother's keeper? I want to answer this question today. Okay. I want to answer this question today. If you say, am I my brother's keeper? Pastor, am I my brother's keeper? Okay. The answer I would give is yes. You are supposed to watch your brother's back. You are supposed to watch your brother's back. Why? What happens is when you try to run away and save your own skin is in times of distress, in times of trouble, in times of war. Even in war, a partner, a soldier partner will not leave his friend alone. There's one friend of mine in uh, Oklahoma. He was, he was a member of a church. It was, his name was Bob. And Bob used to tell us a lot of war stories from uh, Vietnam. And he used to tell wonderful stories. His friend was shot in the leg. And he was the commander. He was telling him not to go there. Not to go to the left or just take a step, even step there. They were, they were very safe here. He moved to the left a little bit. The bullet came and hit him. And he was on the floor. What should you do? You know what Bob did? He said, you're not going to speak a word. 
you disobeyed whatever I said now I'm going to tell you something if you want to live you have to listen to me he said I'm sorry Bob I didn't listen to you he said I'm going to drag you I'm going to put my knife into your thigh and try to pull that bullet out he had to do that and pull him and put him on his back and then dragged him into that camp medical camp and dropped him up there my dear brothers and sisters in our spiritual life in our church when there is an attack on another brother or another sister you need to step up and then watch your brother's back you need to watch your sister's back that is what is church that is what the body of Christ is the body analogy if there is a small prick on this how many kids are uh, excited about shots no not everybody right the shot is given somewhere on the arm but the whole body reacts to that I sees it and is afraid some children scream when I was a kid I ran away from the hospital believe me I ran away from the hospital because they you know those days it was you know they, they I mean if they put, do all the preparation inside and come out that's a different thing right she took the syringe from the hot water and took the syringe and then tries to push the water out <laughs> my goodness and then takes the uh, you know needle and puts it on the top and then also tries to put the distilled water again and push it out man I'm seeing all this rehearsal it's scaring me what did I do I ran away from the hospital I ran away literally I literally ran away from the hospital my dad had to come pull me back and make me sit when the shot is given the whole body reacts this is my prayer that in our church when somebody is hurt I don't want people to back away and say that is not my problem that is between those two no that is a problem within the whole church we have to step up and solve it it's only in the war zone it's only when you want to be selfish that you say that's not my problem that's not my problem there's a there's a German poet called Martin Niemöller he wrote a poem like this during the Nazi days he wrote this poem you can find it on uh, Wikipedia or anywhere on the Google this is what the poem says the poem says they came for the uh, socialists I did not speak up because I was not a socialist then they came for the Catholics I did not speak up because I was not a Catholic then they came for the Jews I did not speak up because I was not a Jew then they came for me and there was nobody left to speak for me just four stanzas Martin Niemöller writes when they came for somebody I didn't speak up because they said that's not my problem they came for another group I didn't speak up because I said that's not my problem they came for another group they I didn't speak up because that's not my problem at last they came for me and when they came for me there was nobody left to speak for me my dear brothers and sisters that is not what church is church is all integration it's a body of Christ I tell you at some point or the other we are guilty that we didn't watch our brothers back we need to stand by our brother and then help them stand by our sister and watch their back protect them that is what the need of the hour is therefore when you are uh, are guilty number one you will do what you will cover up number two the symptoms of guilt when you're guilty what happens is number two is there is an emotional distance between people we may be meeting here and saying hello but the hearts are very far you agree we may embrace we may say hello we may eat together we may do whatever we can together 
but the hearts are very far. Eventually, that becomes indifference. So if they go through a situation, we come to that point and say, I don't care. Why? It's because of that guilt. Number three. Number three. The guilt will kill your self-confidence. You get me? The guilt will kill your self-confidence. You go into a you go into a place and you you see people who you have hurt indirectly or directly. What happens? What happens? You become so restless in that place. And what does Satan do? He'll bring all these things to your mind. And he will play with that. For any problem, there will always be two options. Either deal with the problem or let it fester and let it destroy. I want to share with you one man in the Bible. His name is David. Saul was trying to kill this young man twice at the dinner table. At least in India, we have that at least a minimum respect that while eating that you don't uh, hurt somebody, right? So when I was growing up and then my dad would come home in the evening, I know my dad is mad at me because my scores were low. I showed my papers in the morning and I would keep my papers. I would not show them in the evening itself because he'll have the rest of the night to, you know, butcher me. So I'll wait and then before I leave for the school the next morning, uh, I will try to intentionally on purpose delay and I've just got five minutes to just leave because if I don't leave then I'll be late. So my dad knows that. So within those five minutes then I will take out my papers and bring it to my dad and say, Dad, you need to sign this. At least I was, uh, I was honest. I never signed my dad's signature. So I brought it to my dad and said, Dad, you need to sign this. So what did my dad do? Look at this. Get mad at me. That evening I know that I am going to be the target. So what do I do? I watch for my dad. As soon as my dad comes home, I see uh, him entering our uh, building. You know what I would do? Run into the kitchen and get a plate of food. <laughs> you know why? <laughs> he would not say anything while you're eating. Or I would take my Bible and start reading. <laughs> I use the Bible, I tell you. I use the Bible to protect my skin just to avoid being beaten. And I ate my food. I'm not hungry. <laughs> I'm not hungry at all. But why am I eating? I know that my dad will not do anything uh, harsh to me when I'm eating. Saul took a javelin and while David was eating, threw at this man. Twice he escaped while eating. You find this story in 1 Samuel chapter 18 verse 10 he tried once and chapter 19 verse 10 again he tried again and he also came to that point he is telling Jonathan he said Jonathan as long as this son of Jesse is alive you can never be the king you can never be the king this fellow is a trouble to you as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth neither you nor your kingdom will be established now send and bring him to me for he must die this is how Saul is reacting. What happens? He ran away from uh, Israel. Anointed man. He ran away from Israel. He's, uh, he had to go to a foreign king and then stand at the door and act like a madman with the spittle falling on his beard and with his uh, nails, he's trying to scratch the door and act like a madman. Anointed man of God. He came to such a situation. What happened? What happened? He was trying to hide for his life. He was in the caves. One day Saul came to know where this man was. Saul came to know where uh, David was. And he thought, I'm going to come and kill this fellow. I'm in the story in 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, 
he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi so Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats he came to the sheep pens along the way a cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself David and his men were far back in the cave the men said this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish then David crept up unnoticed and cut off the corner of Saul's robe you know what happened you know the story Saul you know why was Saul there he came trying to hunt for David and that is when uh, Saul was trying to uh, he was uh, inside the cave a little bit and David and his men were all the way inside the cave so David slowly came cut off his robe of his uh, a small piece of his robe and went away he cut he didn't touch him he didn't he didn't he didn't use the knife on him but he just touched the cloth the robe you know what the Bible says look at the next verse verse 5 first Samuel 24 and verse 5 afterward David was conscience stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe he said to his men the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master the Lord's anointed or lift my hand against him for he is the anointed of the Lord what happened just because he cut the corner of his cloth he was conscience stricken he was full of guilt why did I do that my folks tried to encourage me and said go and kill that fellow God has given I mean, usually when such situations come you mean you can use the scripture like that and say God sir this is the right time <coughs> God has given your enemy into your hand he went and cut his robe Bible says he was conscience stricken he says verse 10 this day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hand in the cave some urged me to kill you but I spared you I said I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed he is the Lord's anointed I will not touch him what happened he was conscience stricken okay was David uh, anointed yes was Saul anointed yes was Saul trying to hurt David yes but when Saul did something to David David did something to Saul he was conscience stricken and he said I'm sorry I'm sorry another occasion okay did Saul uh, give up because of this no he again tried this he again tried once more and you find this in chapter 26 again in 26 again you find he tries to attack he tries to attack so what happened um, uh, Saul is trying to attack David so this time what he does is look at verse 9 uh, verse 8 look at verse 8 1 Samuel 26 8 Abishai said to David he's uh, David's follower today God has delivered your enemy into your hands now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear I won't strike him twice what does it mean in one shot I will kill this fellow and pin him to the ground what did David do look at verse 9 he could have said amen right look at verse 9 David said to Abishai don't destroy him who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless when you lay hand on God's anointed you cannot be guiltless now look at verse 16 another thing that he tells these people is he tells these people is what you have done is not good as surely as the Lord lives you and your men deserve to die he's talking to the uh, soldiers who came with Saul because they didn't protect him see he says you deserve to die because you did not guard your master the Lord's anointed look around you where are the king's spear water jug that were near his head he was sleeping David came and then picked up the spear and the water jug and went away and from the other side of the mountain he says hey you see this this is a spear water jug 
Just check. Where is your spear and water jug? Your, your king's uh, spear and water jug? Not here. I was there. I could have killed you, Saul. I did not do that. And he tells his people and say, you fellows need to die because you didn't protect your Lord's anointed. I want to ask you today, church. I want you all to pray for me. You know why? Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7 says, Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. You hear me? Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. If this church has to get destroyed, for example, what is the best way? What's the best way? Attack the shepherd. Let's, let's talk practical. Right? Let's talk practical. What, what, what do you think will happen next Sunday if I'm destroyed this Sunday, the, b before Saturday? You get it? Enemy knows that. I told you he knows the scripture. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, this is what I covet from you. I humbly ask you that in the process of God building his church, it is your responsibility to pray for me. And I covet your prayers. And I say, kindly protect me with the prayers. I don't want to give the details. But as I said, we are under severe attack. And the only way we can overcome this is by prayer. Our God is a victorious God. I'm not afraid of this wiles of enemy at all. I know my God is victorious, but apart from me praying, apart from my family praying, and we need to come together more often to pray. I'm, I'm telling you that is what is, I mean, if you, if you check the gauge, that is what is lacking with us. Midweek service. I have made it to a point that we, we, we pray during the midweek service. We need to come together and pray and then you will see the strength that God will give. David says, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Interestingly, the same David committed sin against Bathsheba. Okay? How did he react? Turn with me to Psalm 51 and verse 4. Psalm 51 and verse 4. Again, you only have I sinned. Against you only have I sinned. And done what is evil in your sight. So that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. You know what David did? He came to the Lord and said, Lord, I am sorry. I am sorry. We sang that song, Shine, Jesus, Shine. I was looking for that verse and I found this in that song. You know what, what we sang this morning? Psalm 139 and verse 23 and 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Search me and see if there is anything offensive in my heart. One author said, if you are feeling guilty, it is because definitely you did not bring that guilt into the presence of God. Sometimes Satan is right. You get me? Sometimes Satan is right. Because he will always come with half truth. He's a, he's a father of liars, definitely. But more than you watching your life, he's, he is watching your life more closely. Because why? He needs to find fault to take it to God and present it as an accusation. If there is something that we have not brought to God and said, Lord, I'm sorry. And this guilt is eating me away. I'm not able to make eye contact with certain people because I know I have my guilt. Sometimes we do it on purpose. Sometimes we do it unintentionally. 
but God says there is a guilt offering available. You can come and offer that and then square it away. You can take care of that. So what do you find? Another verse and then we'll close. Psalm chapter 32. Psalm chapter 32 is a beautiful, beautiful chapter that talks about how to handle this situation. Verse, two and, verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4. When I kept silent. So when, when we do something which is not right and we keep silent, what happens? When I kept silent, my bones waste away through my groaning all day long. I tell you, when you have guilt in your heart, even will your body will try to uh, pull you down. You know? Face is the index of the mind. Right? So the moment you say, oh, you're not happy today, so there's something wrong. We can easily tell that, right? So here you see, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength sapped as in the heat of summer. So this is where David is. This is my situation. So what did David do is the answer, question. Verse 5. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. You forgave the guilt of my sin. How do you overcome this guilt? Confess before God. You confess before God. We might be guilty against God, we might be guilty against people. If you're guilty against God, go to God and tell Him. If you're guilty against people, go talk to them. We are all human beings. Go talk to them, square it away. And be faithful to God. That's what the Bible says. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. And therefore, there is now no condemnation unto all those who are the children of God. There's no condemnation for those who are children of God. My dear brothers and sisters, it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson that uh, we can learn from this guilt offering. God we can remove the guilt from our lives. And how do we do that? When we come to God and say, I acknowledged and confess my sins and do not cover up my sin. That's when God says, we can restore the fellowship again. The joy comes back. That relationship is, that, that the problem that there was in that relationship is now squared up. It's only when we communicate, we talk to God, we talk to people. I've learned one thing. I would not hesitate if I've done something wrong to go and apologize. Because by apologizing, listen to this. By apologizing, you don't become small. Listen to me carefully. By apologizing, you become bigger. You open the way for a person to come and embrace you. You open the way for a person to come back to the original relationship. What happened in the gospel? You know that. We were enemies of Christ. God opened the way. And then he reconciled man to God. Same thing with man and man. Whether we are, whether we recognize it or not, the Bible says this, Leviticus 5. Person may remember it or may not remember it, but he is guilty. Therefore, you must bring that offering. What did Job offer? It was not a burnt offering, a guilt offering, but what did he say? Perhaps my children have committed sin and therefore I will offer this offering. My dear brothers and sisters, God has made a provision for every fall, every uh, uh, tripping in our lives. And this Lord's Supper is one of them. 